okay? I'm chewing some gum, friend. I'm chewing some gum. All right. Let's put the gum away. Yeah, I saw it, brother. I was looking for some names. It's probably on your list. I didn't find that name on my list. I think if I'm too close to the camera, I may scare you guys because I'm so good looking. <laughs> Mustard, here we go. You have recently scrubbed my head about the blinding. What do you say about her? the church? Uh, Rambo <clears throat> or Rambox. Remember what I said about that. According to Ephesians 2.20, the apostles and the holy prophets are the foundation of the building. The building is a spiritual body of believers born of the Spirit, united to Jesus Christ, right? Yeah, I'm sure. I hope the connection stays strong. You don't know how frustrated and anger I get when it's buffers. Yeah, I'm sure. It really frustrates me. All right. Anyway, let's see. Let's pray it stays It stays strong. If not, I don't know what to tell you. We were saying, oh, I'm going to move my bed. That means... Churches do not have the authority to go above and beyond what is written in the sense of contradicting what it's written. You get my point? Churches do not have the authority of going above and beyond what is written in the sense of contradicting what is written, misinterpreting the scriptures, forcing the scriptures to agree with their position and their beliefs. So that's, that's what I would have to say about that. No, why would I watch Virgin Most Powerful Radio today? What was going on in Virgin Most Powerful Radio? I didn't even know there was a radio station called Virgin Most Powerful. My friend, Bas Bazimer, you don't know how much patience I need. I've become one of the most impatient people. Yes, Bas Bazimer, there are a lot of fruit of the Spirit that we haven't perfected or cultivated. You keep focusing on patience, but also... <laughs> One of the fruits of the flesh is division, being divisive and causing divisions. So if you keep talking about patience is the fruit of the spirit and you keep trying to prick me, that means you're trying to cause a fight. So learn what the fruits of the spirit, uh, the flesh are and avoid them. Okay, friend? Okay, Belgium? Because I'll make you some Belgium waffles. <laughs> Soldier of Christ, you're asking me a question that's <clears throat> not clear. What do you mean the spirit of Christ? Because you have Jesus who's truly human. And if he's truly human, and if being truly human means that you have to have a human spirit, a human mind, a human soul, then Jesus has a human spirit. He's still one person with a human spirit. When you say the spirit of Christ, do you mean Jesus' divine nature? Because God is spirit by nature, meaning, understand the question, soldier. Follow with me. God is spirit by nature. When we say God is spirit by nature, we mean God by nature isn't composed of matter. He doesn't have a corporeal shape. He doesn't have a shape. He doesn't have a form. He's shapeless. He's spaceless. He's formless. He's timeless. So when we say that God is spirit, Angels are spirits, but angels are created spirits who have a spiritual shape or form of some kind to differentiate one angel from another. God is spirit by nature. Guys, I need you to listen to this. God is spirit by nature. By spirit, we mean Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are immaterial. They don't have a material form, a material shape, a material body. They are spaceless, placeless, timeless, immaterial, incorporeal, meaning they're, they're not composed of any substance, physical, tangible, material substance, right? Okay. So when you say spirit of Christ, do you mean Jesus in respect to his divine nature? Jesus as God is spirit, meaning that being God, he is shapeless, formless, timeless, placeless, spaceless, like the Father and the Holy Spirit. See, so I can't just say, yeah, the Spirit of Christ is the Holy Spirit. What do you mean, Spirit of Christ? You mean the nature of Christ as God? Do you mean the human spirit that Christ possessed because he took on a human nature? Do you mean the Holy Spirit who belongs to Christ, whom Christ sends out and can command? What do you mean? 
No, you don't mean the nature, soldier of Christ. Because how can the Spirit of Christ be the Holy Spirit? You just made Jesus the same person, the Holy Spirit. So no, you don't mean that. Because if you meant that, then Jesus' Spirit is not the Holy Spirit. Because then you'd say that Jesus by nature is the Holy Spirit. So you made Jesus the Holy Spirit. You're a modalist. You're not a Trinitarian. So no, you didn't mean that. You get my point? Everyone with me there? Tell truth, soldier. I don't know what tell truth there. Okay. We're going to wait a few more minutes. We'll begin and I'll begin in prayer. But That's okay, soldier. But I just want you to think deeply. When someone says, is the Spirit of Christ the Holy Spirit? What do you mean, Spirit of Christ? You mean Jesus is divine nature because God is spirit by nature. So if you mean the Spirit of Christ, his divine nature, is that the Holy Spirit? No. Because the Holy Spirit is a different person from Jesus and a different person from the Father. And all three of them share the divine nature in common. Do you mean the human spirit that's part of his human nature that he created in order to become truly human? Well, the Holy Spirit is not a human spirit and it's not created. Do you mean the Holy Spirit uh, that is under the authority of the Father and the Son? So like when you say the Spirit of Jehovah, you mean the Holy Spirit that belongs to Jehovah, sent out by Jehovah? You get the point? So that's why one thing, teach you guys not to answer a question without first asking, what does the person mean by the question? Don't rush to answer. What do you mean? How are you defining this term? Yeah, Bill Thompson, I have an article on Melchizedek. Ask me to give it to you a little later. No, Melchizedek is not a pre-human appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, you have to ask questions. It's not so much from the tactics book. I'm studying it too. I want to learn his method, and hopefully by the grace of the Holy Spirit, he'll give me the patience to absorb and understand it because I want to be the most effective witness for the glory of Jesus Christ. What do you mean? Okay, I'll give you an example. Why you don't rush in to answer a question without asking the person what does he or she mean by that question or how they understand that term. If a Jehovah Witness asks you, is Jesus Jehovah God? We just started, brother. Don't worry about it. Uh, YouTube doesn't like me too much. Yeah. Sorry, it's buffering. We're praying it's okay. Man, I got a big head. No matter how much weight I lose, my head stays big. What? You guys, did I enable... The super chat? Oh, my goodness. Okay. Thank you, guys. Remember one thing about super chat? YouTube takes 30% of what you give. So, But thank you anyway. God bless you. That shows your, your love for me. And I don't know how to collect on the super chat, but we'll see. This is all new to me. Hopefully, first, last, and Protestant believer will help. Yeah, but guys, thank you. Anything you give will be a blessing to the ministry. But Patreon and PayPal take the least amount of your support. YouTube takes the biggest chunk of your support. It takes 30%. So that $5, they'll take 30%. My goodness. Guy Wilkerson in time. Everything in time, brother. If God is pleased to use me, everything in time. I'm just waiting a few more minutes to get all the familiar faces in. We're going to begin. But so let me give you an example of why you shouldn't rush in to answer a question without asking for specifics. What's up, Rebecca? How are you? How are you, sister? Your face looks familiar. Are you on my Facebook page? Wonder Woman is, I know. You look like someone on my Facebook page. Is that you? God bless you. God bless all of you. Anyway, here. If a Jehovah Witness asks you, if a Jehovah Witness asks you, is Jesus Jehovah God? What would your answer be? God bless every one of you from all the parts of the world. I am honored and humbled that you'd be here to listen to me. To teach you for the glory of Jesus Christ. See, now Karen said yes and Hafsa said yes. Bad mistake. You guys not listening. You know why? Because to the Jehovah Witness, Jehovah is God the Father alone. When you told the Jehovah Witness yes, you just told them that you believe Jesus is the Father. Jesus is the Father. So you didn't listen to what I just told you. Don't rush to answer a question without asking for clarity. What do you mean Jehovah by Jehovah? Oh, I mean the Father. No, Jesus is not the Father. See, you fell for it. 
You see the point? A Jehovah Witness believes Jehovah is the Father alone. Only the Father is Jehovah. So if they say, is Jesus Jehovah? And you say, yes. You just told that person Jesus is the Father. And they're going to say, well, how can he be Jehovah? Is he his own son? Was he praying to himself? Did he send? No, you ask. Uh, Mr. or Miss Jehovah Witness, what do you mean by the term Jehovah? I mean the Father. No, Jesus is not the Father. No, so, so you don't believe he's Jehovah. No, he is Jehovah, but he's not the Father. What do you mean? You assume that only the Father is Jehovah, but the Bible says the Father is Jehovah, his Son is Jehovah, and his Spirit is Jehovah, but they're not the same person. You see the point? Same thing with a Muslim. A Muslim, Allah is the true God, and he's the one who sent Jesus. Now, in our theology, follow with me. This work, I'm preparing you for what's to come. This is not the session yet. In our theology, the one who sent Jesus Christ is God the Father. In Islam, Allah is supposed to be the one who sent. God, thank, God bless you guys for the super chat. I don't know. I feel like I made a mistake enabling it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. Oh, you All right. Okay, listen to me. God the Father is the one who sent Jesus Christ according to our theology. In Islam, Allah is supposed to be the one who sent Jesus. That means the Allah of the Quran is supposed to correspond to God the Father, even though they don't believe Allah is the Father. I need to make sure you're listening to this. I don't want to bless, uh, I don't want to confuse you. The Quran says Allah sent Jesus. In our theology, it's God the Father who sent Jesus. So that means in Islamic theology, Allah corresponds to God the Father, though they don't call him the Father. You get the point? A Muslim will say, the one who sent Jesus, he's the true God. The one who sent Jesus, he is Allah. You say he's the Father, we deny it. But that's the one who's the true God. So with that said, if a Muslim asks you, do you believe Jesus is Allah? If you say yes, again, what you told the Muslim is, Jesus is the God that sent Jesus. So you basically told the Muslim, Jesus is God the Father. You see the point? Hold on. Okay. So that's why you don't answer questions without asking for specifics. God bless you guys. This is new to me. The super chat thing is new to me, guys. So I don't know how David does it or he'll post it on. And hey, thank you. But God bless all of you guys for your super chat. You know, even though I want every penny for the ministry, they could take 30% off. I'm a little stingy and selfish. Now, if I was money bucks like David Wood, made a lot of money like him, I wouldn't care. But anyway, with that said, yeah, don't forget, they take 30% of what you give. This is why the cheapest way to give for now would be Patreon or PayPal because they take the least amount. These YouTubers, man, this YouTube page, greedy, money-hungry folks. Why would they take 30% of what you're given to a YouTuber? I don't understand. But... That's YouTube for you. Oh, well. But did you understand what's my point? My point is you don't just rush and answer a question. What you say is, what do you mean, Jehovah? What do you mean by Allah? What do you mean by God? Ask questions. When you get clarification, then you can answer more appropriately. Now, with that said, I want to give you some links, okay? Links to articles that I want you to <clears throat> download. You have my permission. Download to your websites. Print them out. Distribute them. Save the links. But one thing I want you to do is study the articles. Study the arguments. Study the information. Ask the Holy Spirit to save you from any mistakes I've made and to make known those mistakes to me to correct them. And ask the Holy Spirit to enable you to absorb anything that was sound and factual and correct. Make it second nature and then use it in your own witness because I want you to teach this to the world for the glory of Jesus. So I'm going to give you some articles on the topic of Jesus being omniscient. Does Jesus know everything? Well, if he's God, shouldn't he know everything? 
articles on Mark's depiction of Jesus's omniscience, what Mark has to say about Jesus being the God man and knowing all things. And yet as a man, he doesn't know the day or hour. So I'm going to give you the links. So here, are the, here they are. Save them. I'm going to put them in the description box, God willing, when the session is over. I'm going to post four links to four articles. Okay, here's one. This article I wrote years ago, The Omniscience of Jesus Christ According to Mark's Gospel. I show places in the Gospel of Mark where Mark depicts Jesus as omniscient. Because he's God, not just man. He's the God man. Mark depicts Jesus as being omniscient. So this is the first article. I'm going to post the link three times. Guys, save these links. Okay, that's the first article. Okay. Second article from my blog. The Mark in Jesus. The physical embodiment and visible appearance of Israel's God. Here is the second article. Yes, Jesus will return physically bodily to the earth to judge living in the dead and establish a new heavens and a new earth shadow. That is biblical teaching, and that's been the position of the historic church. Okay, now, the second article. This is a short post where I show from Mark's gospel, Mark depicting Jesus as Jehovah God of the Old Testament. That in Mark's gospel, Mark portrays Jesus as doing things that the Old Testament says only Jehovah does. So here's the second article. That's the link. Okay, let me post it three times. Because we're Trinitarians, I like to do things in three. Now, for the last two articles. This is a two-part rebuttal to Zami Zetri, Muhammad and Zami Zetri, whom glory to the triune God was sent into retirement, him and Sa Sami uh, Basam Zawari I wrote a two part response to its attempt to refute the fact that God's gospel portrays Jesus as omniscient as the omniscient Lord and to refute the fact that Mark depicts Jesus as the God man a two part rebuttal that embarrassed him right and glory to God because of our efforts and our rebuttals to him the answering Islam website Producing rebuttals to these Mohammedans who thought they were qualified to biologists. Many of them gave up. Glory to the triune God. That's why you don't hear about Sami Zatari anymore or Basam Zawari or Ibn Anwar. Because by the grace of God, being pleased to bless us and our meager efforts, we silence them and send them packing with their prophet. And notice, folks, this is a true statement. Any and every website that has tried to refute our material, they don't last long. They disappear. Here you go. Here is part one. God bless you guys. Thank you. Thank you for all the support. Here's part one. I'm going to post it three times. Please save the links. Please. Okay. Download them to your website. Print them and pass them to others. Memorize the material, share them in your Sunday schools, in your Bible studies, in your apologetic classes. And if you do download them, keep the name of the article and the author intact. Don't sell them. Freely you receive, freely you give. See, I don't ask you for money to read this. No. If God puts in your heart to want to contribute to the mystery, God bless you. If you don't, God bless you anyway. Right? Okay, so now here's part two. Here's part two. Lord willing, in this third and final part of my thorough discussion of why Jesus doesn't know the dare hour, I will have provided one of the most thorough explanations, in-depth explanations on why Jesus doesn't know the dare hour, and now will be archived on this YouTube channel so that any time this question comes up, why doesn't Jesus know the dare hour? You can point them to this three-part in-depth <clears throat> exegesis, explanation, exposition of what that means. So here's part two. Okay. Part two. God bless you again. Sam, you need to understand. What I'm okay. Just want to again thank you. All you guys, you super chatters, God bless you. This is the first time I enabled super chat, so it's blowing me away. So Lord bless you guys, all of you. Your reward is with the Lord Jesus. Let me just share something with you. I cannot repay you for your kindness and your love, right? <clears throat> what I can do is 
exercise the gift that God has given me to teach and teach you all the wisdom and knowledge that the Spirit has been pleased to give me because he gave it to me to use it to build up the church, the body of Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, my brothers and sisters. That's the only way I can repay you. Financially, I cannot repay you, right? All I can do is continue to serve you with the gifts that the Spirit has given me, which is teaching and to continue writing articles and rebuttals, making it accessible for you, my brothers and sisters, to then use the material to glorify Christ. Ultimately, your reward is with Jesus. And may he richly reward you guys, bless you and your families, keep you in love with him, seal you by his spirit, never let you go, but bring you into his everlasting kingdom and bring me into his everlasting kingdom where we will be together forever in the presence of Jesus, in perfect bodies, perfectly loving Jesus, perfectly worshiping Jesus, and having perfect fellowship no more pain, no more sin, no more death, no more evil, no more Satan. Lord Jesus, may that day come sooner than later. Maran Athe. And I also pray the Lord Jesus bless any of your loved ones who are not saved, that in his mercy, he'll bring them to his feet and save them. And bless your loved ones, whether your parents, your siblings, your spouses, your children. In my case, may the Lord Jesus flood my daughters in his love, seal them by his spirit, Washed them in his blood and blessed their mother, convicting her to repent and fear before the face of Jesus Christ so that she'll be saved. Okay. So again, thank you for the super chat. God bless you. If God puts in your heart, we can use this support. But again, just remember, super chat, YouTube takes 30% of what you give. Yep. But they take 30% of what you give. And I'm greedy. I need every penny I can get to do the ministry. But thank you. God bless you. Your reward is with Jesus. So now, did you guys save those links? Did you guys save those links? Because we're about to begin. We're going to begin in a minute. Did you guys save those links? I will put the links to the articles in the description box when I'm done. Now, one thing I wanted to mention that I did not mention yesterday. Someone asked me. When will I write a commentary to the Bible? Meaning, you know, have you have these study Bibles that have notes to the Bible verses? Someone asked me, when will I do that? Am I willing to do that? Right? Someone asked me that question. Why don't you write a commentary with the Bible? Right? Okay. Now, you know what's funny, folks? I'm going to let you in on a little secret. You know what's funny, folks? Years ago... You guys ready? You guys ready to hear a secret? You guys ready? Okay. Come on. I want to see if you're ready. Years ago, I finished a massive commentary on the entire Quran. And part of that project, I wrote over 20 appendices to go with that Quran commentary. I finished it. It's done. Years ago, I wrote a commentary on the 114 chapters of the Quran, going through each surah and making comments on those passages that I thought were relevant and important for Christian evangelists and apologists to Muslims. And I wrote over 20 appendices. Appendix, right? Appendices. I'm still waiting for that Quran project to see the light of day. It's now beyond my control. The gentleman that hired me to do it, he's got all the my material. He's got all the appendices, but it's been over six years. And from the from the look of it, I don't ever think I don't think it's ever going to see the light of day. Thank you, Steve. God bless you guys, all of you guys. So it's beyond my control. I have the entire commentary of the Quran on my computer and all the appendices. I've saved them. No, he's not from ABN. And I'm not sharing this to vilify anyone, to make you get angry at anyone. Because of this, we had a falling out. The brother and I had a falling out, but we reconciled. But I can tell there's still some hurt feelings on his part and he hasn't forgiven me fully. And so I don't want to be a stumbling block to him because it's not my fault. 
it's his fault that this project has not seen the light of day because he delayed it and didn't raise enough funds to get it edited. And so when I went after him and I complained to some of the supporters who helped finance the project, he got very angry with me and was upset with me. So I won't mention his name because I've tried to reconcile with him and I've forgiven him, but I don't think he's forgiven me completely. I can still see he's uncomfortable, but to be honest, it is his fault. So he's being angry for his sin and for me holding him accountable. Okay, so no, no, you didn't take the funds, King of Kings. The man is a man of integrity. He's not money hungry. He's not, he doesn't prostitute himself for money. He loves Jesus. He loves Muslims. He got enough funds to finance me to do the project, right? So he was paying me just to focus on the project, which I did. The problem is he didn't raise up enough funds then to get the editing of the project underway. Okay, the editing of the project. And so because he didn't raise raise up enough funds for that, it's now lying dormant somewhere. And I had said, I'm just going to publish it on my blog. And he went angry. He went livid, right? Because I was going to publish it on my blog. And again, if I publish it on my blog, it's free of charge. I'm not getting paid for it. So it's not like I'm publishing to make money. I just want to put it out there because I promise you guys, I promise you guys, this is the most comprehensive commentary on the Quran from a Christian perspective done from an apologetic evangel evangelistic perspective so that if you put this Quran in the hands of Christians, it will be a weapon that will decimate Muslims in your witness and your debate. Right? Uh, it's his fault because he didn't raise up enough funds for the editing aspect of the project. So when I got on his case and saying, let's do something about it, it's now been over six years. It hasn't seen the light of day. At the very least, let me publish it on my blog. He got angry at me. So I don't want to cause any division. I don't want to be a stumbling block to him. I've forgiven him. He's my brother because he is a soldier. He loves the Lord. But I don't think he's forgiven me for his mistake. I'm holding him accountable. Look, we did the project. I finished. People want to see it. But you know how it is. We're all sinners. I'm sinners. I don't like to be told I'm wrong. I don't like to be held accountable because I'm a proud, arrogant sinner. May God crucify my flesh. So that's how it works. Brother, 114 surahs. I pretty much did a commentary on every single surah. It doesn't mean I gave a commentary for every verse. I gave a commentary to those passages which I felt were crucial and important in Christian evangelism and apologetics. So you'll hear me talk about predestination and and free will, and the Trinity, and Tawheed. And then on top of that, I wrote over 20 appendices, right? So that's, I have done a commentary, but I did it on the Quran. It's beyond my control, and I can't tell you his name, because I don't want you guys to contact him and get on his case, because it's going to upset him and hurt him more, and he's going to think I'm slandering him. For the record, let me repeat again, he's a man of integrity. He loves Jesus Christ. He loves Muslims, and he's willing to die to see Muslims get saved. And he didn't mismanage funds. He got enough funds to finance me to do it so I wouldn't have to struggle financially for that entire period of time as I was focusing on it. He didn't. It wasn't like I was rich, so I don't think I was making thousands every month. Just enough to pay my bills, take care of my daughters, to focus on the project. So I finished it. It's finished. He tried to get it edited. But because he couldn't hire the right people because of the lack of funds. It took me over a year to finish it, Turb, over a year, maybe close to two years. Yes. So I can't tell you his name, folks, because honestly, he still hasn't forgiven me from his heart. I know it because when I see him, I try to be kind to him and love him. And I'm gracious to him, but I can tell from his demeanor and his face, he's not comfortable with me, even though him and I were very tight and very close. But in all honesty, it's not my fault. 
I'm not saying I'm faultless, but here I was right to be angry and hold them accountable because I spent at least two years finishing the commentary and it's never seen the light of day. And it's been over six years and we're still waiting. Right? Over six yeah. years. And when, when I said I was going to post it, post it on my blog, he went angry. He got angry. He went livid. Yeah. And someone told me, put my PayPal. The way you can contribute on PayPal is when you go to www.paypal.com, you just send it to the email. Sam underscore S-H-M-N at hotmail.com. So guys, pray that the project sees the light of day because I promise you, it will be one of the best commentaries ever produced on the Quran from a Christian perspective. And you know what's disheartening? Disheartening. You want to hear what's disheartening? As the Lord Jesus loosens my tongue. Disheartening. Boy, my lisp. Zondervan is coming out with a Christian commentary of the Quran by Gordon Nickel. It's already about to come out. That means a project I finished hasn't seen the light of day. And someone after me will come out with a commentary on the Quran from a Christian perspective this year. Yep, Gordon Nickel. A Christian commentary on the Quran by a renowned Christian publisher, Zondervan. Zondervan. And again, I don't want you to think I'm being arrogant when I say this. I'm not being arrogant. I promise you, Gordon Nickel's commentary on the Quran won't be anywhere near the depth of what we were able to produce by the grace of the chime God, by the grace of the Holy Spirit. But what can I do? It's beyond my control, right? Let me find it. Let me find it. Let me find that commentary. And I was just told not too long ago, it's coming out. And I saw uh, the advertisement on Amazon. It disheartened me. I'm like, wow. Because this work of, of ours that God was pleased to allow me to finish would have been the first of its kind in modern times. It would have been the first of its kind in modern times, right? But now Gordon Nickel beat us to it, even though we finished it before his here. Zondervan, Christian commentary on the Quran. Here goes yep here you go it's coming out and guess what it's 60 bucks it's coming out april 28 2020 here it is sad isn't it 60 bucks here you go brother it's beyond my control when you say funded it's beyond my control because it's not in my hands and i don't want to mention the person's name because he's going to think i'm bashing him he's very sensitive He's going to think that I went public to bash him. And I'm not bashing him. I'm being honest as to the situation because I was asked if I've written a commentary in the Bible. No, I've written a commentary on the Quran with over 20 appendices. There it is. There's the link. It's done. It's been finished. Over six years. I finished it over six years ago, if I recall correctly. Yeah, I believe it was six years ago. Maybe even longer. Right? Yep, there's none I can do, brethren. What you can do, though, Marina, my sister, this wasn't my project. It was the project of a Christian brother, and he asked me if I would do the commentary. He has rights to it. In other words, if I go ahead, he's going to get upset and angry and think that somehow... I'm going above him or I'm betraying his trust. And I don't want to do that. No, it's not that it's copyrighted. It was his idea, his project. If I do anything to try to publish it, he's going to think I've betrayed him and that, you know, I'm being dishonest for going ahead and trying to publish it when it was his project. So for the sake of unity, I don't want to do anything to agonize him because we already split over this and I'm seeking reconcil reconciliation. I'm not trying to make myself a saint. I'm not. I got angry with him. We got real nasty, right? I was upset with him. And then because of that, we didn't speak for years. And then the Lord softened my heart. I've reached out to him. I've showed him love. I've tried to reconcile with him. And I can still tell from his demeanor and face, he's not comfortable with me. He's not. 
But the irony is it's not my fault. You get the point? But I did my part, and I'm just letting you know the facts. Sai Christian, what's up, bro? Sai Khalilabu, the Sadr uh, PayPal. Uh, Super Chat's going to take 30% of what you just gave me, bro. And I need the money because you know who we're dealing with in, in our state. Anyway, so that's that's where it stands right now. So to answer your question, I have written a commentary. And I wrote a commentary on the Quran. And I guarantee you, I'm not trying to say I'm smarter than Gordon Nickel. I'm not. I'm not saying I'm smarter than him. I guarantee you his commentary will be approaching it from a different angle from the one I did because I focused primarily on writing an exposition of the Quran from a apologetic, evangelistic perspective. It was the combat kit to put in the hands of Christians to carry that Quran with them when they're debating Muslims, so when they bring up a passage, you go there and you have something in the commentary to help you address that situation and refute their objection. So here's what you can do. Here's what you can do. Here's what you can do. Pray and ask the triumph God, seek the face of the Lord Jesus and ask the Holy Spirit to stir things up again and get the ball rolling to finish the project. Because the hearts of all of us are in the hands of the triune God. He can now put a conviction in the hearts of the right people to get the project going and so it can see the light of day. All right. So is that clear? Thank you, guys. God bless you for all the super chats. Thank you. Is that clear? If we're clear, we can begin. Do you save the links to those articles? Now, I know you guys are really excited, right, to see that project, to see that, that commentary published. They're like, man, please, please, please. All right. With that said, we love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Have your way with us in this session. And, Father, please save us from attacks of the enemy, distractions of the enemy, from the children of the enemy. Bring only those that you want to be here to hear the truth by the power of the Holy Spirit and be convicted to fall in love with Jesus and repent. And Father, bless this session. Bless the internet connection. Bless me, your prophet, profitless servant. Fill me with wisdom and knowledge and power from your Holy Spirit, Father. Enable me to recall the passages and interpret them correctly and perfectly as your Spirit guides this conversation to glorify Jesus Christ, your heart that became flesh our God and Savior, our love, the Lord Jesus. And Father, bless the people here. Fill them with wisdom and knowledge, understanding from your spirit. Excite them. Excite their hearts to be on fire with passionate love for Jesus, to stand in awe of the depth and the beauty of your word, the Holy Bible, Father. And take us to a higher level of holiness and purity and love and trust and faithfulness, Father. And Father, please fight our battles. Save us from the world. Save us from Satan. Save us from our flesh and save us from these corrupt, Wicked systems trying to destroy us. Save us, Father. Save our loved ones. Save my angels, my daughters, Father. Love them as only you can love them. Shield them with the blood of Jesus. Seal them by your spirit and have your way, Father. Anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to the ears of your servants and fill my chest and my lungs and, mo and my throat with the breath of life, the health I need to do this for your glory. We need you, Bobby. We need you, Abba. We need you, Lord Jesus. We need you, Holy Spirit. We praise this in Jesus' name. Yahovah, Father, Son, and Spirit. Yahovah, Father, Son, and Spirit. The good thing about Sahih Christian, because he knows me face-to-face -face and Al D, all they need to do is just come, and I can open up my computer, and I can show them the surahs and my commentary and even send it to them. Ooh. <whistles> all right. With that said, this is going to be the third part of my in-depth exposition of what it means for Jesus Christ not to know the dare hour, right? What it means for Jesus Christ not to know the dare hour. You must have heard the two previous parts yesterday, day before, in order to follow along and understand what I'm about to say, because I'm going to be building on the foundation already laid by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> 1611, on your way to heaven. Yeah, it's on my computer, 1611. It's on my old computer, and it's saved on my emails because what I would do is every time I finished a surah, I would send it as an email attachment. So I have it in my emails. I have all that material. 
It's in my emails. Now, with that said, we're going to continue where we left off yesterday. I made a thorough case from the Gospel of Matthew that Matthew depicts Jesus as Jehovah, God Almighty in the flesh. Now, listen and follow with me because I want you to learn this material and use it to glorify the triune God and to proclaim that Jesus is God in the flesh. Matthew, I made a thorough case from Matthew that Jesus is Jehovah God Almighty in the flesh. And yet he's not the Father, he's not the Spirit. He's one with the Father and the Spirit in essence. Three persons, one God. Yesterday I made a similar case from the Gospel of Mark that Jesus Christ is Jehovah God of the Old Testament, Jehovah God Almighty coming to his temple, Jehovah God who becomes flesh, who becomes a human being, so that even according to Mark, Jesus is the God-man. And even according to Mark, Jesus is not the Father. He's not the Spirit. He's the Son of the Father working in union with the Spirit so that Mark, like Matthew, depicts God as triune, triunity of God in Mark as well as in Matthew. And if I have time, I'll show you in Luke, which I will in my series, which I haven't finished, the deity of Christ in the Synoptic Gospels. So, so far, I've made a case. So far, I've made a case from Matthew and Mark Jesus is Jehovah of the Old Testament. He is the God of Israel of the Old Testament who became a flesh and blood human being. So now he's one person, two natures. He's the God man. As Jehovah God, he is all knowing because God by nature is omniscient. And if Jesus is the true God, then he is omniscient. But at the same time, Jesus is also human. He's the God man. He's one eternal divine person who took on a human nature and a physical body that he created in union with the spirit. And he added a second nature to his person, the nature of a human creature. So as a human being, he has a human mind. He has a human body. He has a human will, human emotions, right? Human soul, human, whatever makes a human being truly human. Jesus possesses that with the exception of sin. Is that clear? Is that clear? Because I'm going to go slowly as we unpack this. Now, let me show you some examples. And this is all in the articles that I just posted the links to. All this material will be found in the articles, the links of which I already gave you. And I'll put in the description box, Lord willing, when it's done. Now, let me show you again some examples from Mark's gospel that Jesus is omniscient. That Jesus is omniscient. Let me give you the link to that article again. I wrote an article on Jesus' omniscience according to the Gospel of Mark. Here's that article again. Let me repost the link. Not two nations, two natures, but I know what you meant. Okay. I'm just going to give you the example I gave yesterday, and I'll give you one more example that Mark depicts Jesus. Follow me. Mark depicts Jesus as omnipresent and omniscient. Because as God, he sees all things, he's aware of all things, and everything is present before him. But as a flesh and blood human being, as a man, in his physical body, he's limited to time, space, and place. So let me explain what I mean. Jesus, in respect to his humanity, in reference to his human nature, his physical body, that physical body that Jesus inhabits can only be at one place at one time which is why we don't see the physical body of Jesus before us wherever we turn, right? It's not there. It's not, right? His physical body, because it's truly human, and being truly human, it's limited to time, space, and place. His physical body is now in heaven. But as God, in his divine nature, he's spaceless, timeless, shapeless, formless, right? So the entire creation is present before him, and he oversees all creation, and he's aware of all things as God and virtue in re respect to his divine nature, right? I'm teaching right now. I'm live streaming. I'll call you a little later. You with me there? Is that clear? Now, let me show you that even Mark depicts Jesus as omniscient. And I'll unpack the meaning of omnipresence. In a moment. Let's go back and look at that passage we looked at yesterday. Mark 2, we're going to read verses 5 to 9. Here I'm just going to focus on his omniscience. Mark 5 to 9. You can tell these. this is 2X and it's become big on me. Glory to Jesus. I pray I'll fit an L and get my muscle tone. 
Okay, Mark 2, 5 to 9. Okay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, the paralytic, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. In their hearts. They were not verbalizing this. Something they were saying within themselves. In their hearts. <clears throat> Why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately, when Jesus perceived in his spirit, I explained this yesterday, I'll explain it again. In his spirit, that they so reason within themselves, not verbally, not out loud, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? Whether is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and take up thy bed and walk? Now, pay attention. I said this, but I'm going to repeat it again because we are creatures of repetition. We need to hear something over and over again. As the Holy Spirit just blesses the connection for the glory of Jesus. Okay. When Mark says, immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit, that's Mark's way of referring to Jesus' divine nature. Again, let me repeat. In his spirit doesn't mean his human spirit that he took, took on and created when he took on human nature. In his spirit doesn't mean the Holy Spirit. In his spirit means in respect to his divine nature, being God with a divine nature, as God, he knew what they were thinking. That's what this phrase means in Mark. Don't expect Mark to use modern vocabulary or modern theological terms to describe the two natures of Christ. In other words, you and I would say immediately in regards to his divine nature, but that's how we say it. That doesn't mean that's how Mark is going to express it. So we want to see how Mark would express the two natures of Christ and how they relate together in one person. So this is Mark's way of saying immediately in respect to his divine nature, immediately as God, he knew what they were thinking. That's his way of saying it. You want me there? The very fact that is to say, immediately Jesus knew in his spirit. Immediately Jesus knew in his spirit. That's significant because to qualify that, that qualification assumes Jesus has more than one nature. Because think about it. Why even say immediately he knew in his spirit? If that doesn't assume that he's more than spirit, there's another aspect to him, another nature to him. That is not spirit. So even that language shows that Mark is aware Jesus has two natures. One nature that is spirit, meaning God, divine, and another nature that is flesh, meaning human. That's Mark's way of highlighting the fact Jesus has two natures. Is that sinking in? Before I move on. Okay. So... Immediately in his spirit, meaning immediately by virtue of his divine nature, immediately because he's God, he knew what they're thinking in their hearts. That makes sense because Jesus is true, still truly God on earth. He never stops being God. And as God, he still has omniscience. But I'll explain why he doesn't know that they are in a minute. So it doesn't surprise us that because Jesus is God, and in respect to his divine nature, he is spirit because the nature of God is spiritual. It's not material. It's not physical. It's not corporeal, right? That in respect to his divine nature, which is spirit, he knows all things because God knows all things. So now let's compare Jesus knowing what they're thinking in their hearts, what they're thinking in themselves. Let's compare that knowledge that Jesus has with what the Old Testament says about Jehovah and Jehovah alone knowing what people think in their hearts. You ready? 1 Kings 8, verse 39. 1 Kings 8, verse 39. Let's see. The knowledge that Jesus has is the knowledge which the Hebrew Bible ascribes to Jehovah. And thank first last for serving us. Protestant couldn't be here. The Lord bless that brother. Then hear thou in heaven. Notice the two things that Jehovah does that Jesus did in Mark 2. Jesus forgave the paralytic his sins and knows what the men were thinking in their hearts. Notice what Solomon says about Jehovah. Then hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place and forgive and do and give to every man according to his ways, whose heart thou knowest, 
whose heart you know, Jehovah. For thou, you, even thou, only knowest the hearts of all the children of men. So Jehovah alone knows the hearts of the children of men, the sons of men. Jehovah alone has power to forgive sins on earth, to do things that Jesus does and possesses in Mark 2. Right? First Chronicles 28, verse 9. First Chronicles 28, verse 9. I got to shave my head. First Chronicles 28, verse 9. And thou, Solomon, my son, know thou the God of thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. For Jehovah searcheth all hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. Jehovah searcheth hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of the, of the thoughts. If thou seek him, he will be found of thee. But if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. So notice, Jehovah knows all the imaginations, all the desires, all the thoughts of the hearts of all men. Jesus knew the thoughts, the imaginations of the hearts of those men who were complaining against him. Jehovah forgives sins, sins from heaven. Jesus forgave sins on earth. Are you seeing what Mark is doing in Mark 2? Mark has just ascribed to Jesus some of the unique characteristics that belong to Jehovah alone. Do you see it? Okay. Let me give you a final example from Mark of Jesus' omniscience. One more example. Now, I give you more examples of Jesus' omniscience in this article. Okay. Now, let's go to Mark 7, 24 to 30. And then I'm going to explain what omnipresence means and does not mean. Because we need to know what we mean when we say God is omnipresent. Okay. Mark 7, verses 24 to 30. Read with me. And from thence he arose and went into the borders of Tyre and Sidon and entered into a, a house and would have no man know it, but he could not be hid. For a certain woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek. She was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician from the area of Syria and Phoenicia around Lebanon by nation. And she besought him that he would cast forth the devil out of her daughter. But Jesus said unto her, Let the children first be filled, for it is not meet to take the children's bread and to cast it unto their dogs. I already did an entire session on what this means. I did it about a month ago. Go back, you'll see how amazing Jesus' words, words to her truly are. But anyway, focus. Notice what she says. And she answered and said unto him, Yes, Lord, yet the dogs under the table eat of the children's crumbs. Here's where you got to really pay attention, 29 and 30. It's Mark 7, 29 and 30. Really pay attention. And he said unto her, for this saying, go thy way, the devil is gone out of thy daughter. And when she was come to her house, she found the devil gone, gone out and her daughter laid upon the bed. Now notice, she's asking Jesus to cast out a demon from her daughter. Jesus says, go, the demon is gone. But he wasn't physically there in the physical vicinity or the physical home where the daughter was and where the demon happened to be. So notice, without having to be there physically, he commanded the demon to leave and knew the moment he left. And he says, go, the demon is gone. And he's the one who cast out the demon because she's coming to him to cast out the demon. Did you catch it? Go, the demon is gone. Don't worry about it. I got rid of him. How? You're not there. How did you do it? Physically, you're not there. How did you cast out the demon? Because as God, I don't have to be physically there. As God, the entire creation is before me. So even though physically I'm here, as God, I can command the demon, leave, get lost. Get out of here. And he obeys. Exactly, Mickey. She didn't even tell him where she lived. And he knew exactly the location. So you see that here you have from Mark, Jesus being depicted as omnipresent, omniscient deity in the flesh. He wasn't there physically. He wasn't even told the physical location. And as he's talking to her, he's commanding the demon Leave now. And he's gone. 
Go. I've already gotten rid of him. Don't worry about it. See what's happening? Before I move on, I just want you to catch it. Is that sinking in? See how much meat there is in Mark? A lot of meat, right? So let me explain what omnipresence doesn't mean. What does omnipresence mean and it doesn't mean? When we say God is omnipresent, remember, God by nature is spirit. The divine nature is spirit. This is where you really need to understand and follow with me. By spirit, we're not saying God is a spirit like angels are spirits or humans have spirits because angels are spirit creatures that have spiritual shape and form, which is why I can see Michael and know that's Michael and there's Gabriel. Though they don't have physical bodies, they have spiritual forms, spiritual forms, spiritual shapes that occupy time and space distinct from each other. We're not saying God is spirit like that. When we say God is spirit, we mean God by nature doesn't have a shape. God by nature doesn't have a form. God by nature doesn't have a material body. God by nature is invisible. God by nature is formless. God by nature is shapeless. And God doesn't occupy time and space. Okay? With me there? That's what we mean. So when I say God is omnipresent, I'm not saying he's omnipresent in a physical way, a material way. So that God is omnipresent. So here, this table, that's God's physical substance. That's his body. Or when I touch me, I'm touching God. That would be Hinduism. That would be pantheism. All is God. God is all. That would be the Hindu concept of panentheism. God is in all and all is in God. Because in Hinduism, God is a force, an energy. Right? That's part of the universe. That's part of you. That's not what we mean when God is omnipresent. By omnipresence, we mean every part of creation is under the sustaining power of God. Every part of creation is being sustained by God, is being preserved by God, is being guided by God. Every part of creation is receiving life from God. So since all creation is preserved by God, guided by God, is being given life by God, there is no part of creation outside of his control, outside of his influence, outside of his knowledge, outside of his sustaining power. You get my point? But I'm not saying he's omnipresent in the sense that when I sit on the chair, I'm sitting on God. Or this shirt is God. Or, hey, God. I'm not saying that in some sense, God has a substance that fills creation. No. God is insubstantial, meaning he doesn't have a material substance. That's what I mean, right? Is that clear? You understand now what you mean by omnipresence, what you don't mean by omnipresence? So if someone tells you, oh, you believe God is omnipresent? So is God in your toilet? See, that shows that person is an idiot. Because we're not saying he's omnipresent so that he's in something Physically or in something materially, like water I can put in a cup, right? Like here, this pen, it's in the cup. But the pen is material. It's physical, right? It has shape. It has volume. It occupies space. That's not what we mean by God because God doesn't have volume, doesn't have shape, doesn't occupy space. So I'm not saying... God is in creation like this pen is in this bottle. That's why when someone tells you, is God in your toilet? Say, no, you and your mother are in my toilet. I'm about to flush you. Because who told you that's what it means for God to be omnipresent? You get my point? You understand what we don't mean and what we do mean? Because you got to learn these terms. So what do we mean? This is what we mean. All creation, every part of it, is being preserved by God, receives life from God, is being guided by God, and sustained by God's power. So there's nothing outside of God's knowledge. He's aware of everything because if he's not aware of everything, that means not everything is in his control. And if not everything is in his control, it cannot exist because he's the source of life. You need him to sustain you for you to exist and to be. You get my point now? 
You just got a very in-depth course on omnipresence that many people have to go to seminary to learn and waste money on seminary professors when this should be taught to you by your pastors in your church for free. Right? You want me there? So you understand now what it means for God to be omnipresent and what it means for God not to be omnipresent? I had to explain this because I really want you guys to be the best you possibly can be for Jesus. And you pray for me to be the best I can possibly be for Jesus. Holy, on fire for Jesus. Pure for Jesus. And that he'll fight for my, for my freedom. Remove all shackles and give me the financial freedom to take care of my children for his glory. Ch Chaldean Assyrian, one of the worst mistakes you can do is to go to seminary. Because the seminary you're going to go to, and I'm sorry to say this, will be Catholic institutions who are permeated by liberal critical scholarship that will destroy your faith, not build it up. Let me give you an advice, Chaldean. Go get you a secular uh, degree. Get a degree in some secular field. Maybe be a doctor or lawyer. So you can have money to fall on and then study theology the way you're doing and teach the word. But I promise you, if you go to seminary, I promise you, because you come from a Catholic tradition, your Catholic institutions, and this is not me saying it, it's even conservative Roman Catholics will tell you, most of your institutions have become so liberal that when you enter seminary, you come out losing your faith. You with me there? Now, remember, when the Lord called me into ministry, I was already thrown out of school. Let me just give you why didn't, why didn't I get a degree in some secular field? Okay. Folks, for the record, even when it comes to Protestants, I would be very leery going to college and seminary because even our evangelical seminaries term are churning out wishy-washy, effeminate pastors and theologians who don't speak with authority or confidence or conviction. Because what's happening in the evangelical institutions is they're trying to get the respect and love of liberal critical scholarship, liberal academia. So they're making concessions and saying things to appease them, which 100 years ago would have been condemned as heretical. <clears throat> you with me there? Okay. Now, let me, let me give you real quickly because it's about Jesus. So let me just share my testimony. I was thrown out of high school. I was thrown out of high school because I had severe low self-esteem. I couldn't be around a group of people because I would start panicking and I would think people would judge me. So I would skip school. So for three years, I'd only go to division high school and never go to classes. And I got thrown out. My third year of high school, I got thrown out. In fact, I remember, I think there was 298 students. I was 297 on the list. There was only one guy who beat me. Right, I was the second to last of the worst students. Okay, anyway, now I got thrown out of high school. So I had no interest in going to college. I got my GED because I had to get a GED, which is a high school equivalency diploma. And I wanted to become a bodybuilder martial arts to get into acting. My goal was to become a Hollywood star because I couldn't imagine myself going to college and getting a degree and working for someone because of my esteem issues. The Lord then saved me and convicted me and called me to full-time ministry in 1999. Now, here's one thing I wish I had. I wish I had, let's say, some skill in some secular field that prayed pretty well so I could fully support myself to do ministry and not depend on people to help support me. Because number one, I don't want to be a burden on people. But number two, I don't want to jump through hoops and tickle ears for support. That I won't do. And I pray I don't do. And God saved me from prostituting myself for money. Because it's very easy when you're depending on people to support your ministry to then tickle ears and compromise so that you can keep them supporting you and not lose supporters. You get my point? Right? God forbid, may I never do that, prostitute myself, be true to my convictions, knowing the Lord will provide. Because right now, my concerns for my kids, their provision. If I did not have kids, I would sleep in my car. I would sleep in a storefront. I don't care. I'd be free. 
Okay. So I want you guys to avoid that pitfall because once you're tied in to a ministry and you are ministry supported, you may end up compromising and having tickle it uh, having to tickle people's ears to get the support to come in. And that's wrong. You don't want to compromise or prostitute yourself, water down the word because you need money to pay your bills and feed your family. Right? So my advice for every one of you, do not go to Bible college or seminary unless you want to come out more dead than alive. God has blessed you with resources online, these YouTube channels, these websites. I promise you, you're going to learn more from following David Wood, Anthony Rogers, myself, then you will in seminary. I promise you that. The only thing you learn in seminary is biblical languages. That's about it. Okay? So by way of testimony, by way of testimony, let me just share this with you. No high school diploma, no college, no university, no seminary. What does that tell you about the power of God? to enable you to know the scriptures and to speak with power and wisdom and authority from the spirit. No high school, no college, no university, no seminary. And look at me. You understand? I'm not boasting in myself. God forbid. I'm boasting in the triune God. Okay? If God can do this through me, Imagine what he can do through you if you believe and if you yield. Okay? So let me encourage you. Do not go to Bible college or seminary. Take the information that we're making available. Study it. And I promise you, you'll be more than equipped and ready for the battle for the glory of God. I promise you that. Do you think you're going to get the information on Islam in a seminary that you get from David Wood's Acts 17 Apologetics Channel? You serious? Do you think you're going to get the information on the Trinity, the deity of Christ, his two natures, <clears throat> the overall biblical witness to the Trinity and the deity of Christ, all the New Testaments, from a seminary that you get from listening to Anthony Rogers or myself and others? You won't. Folks, let me give you another true story. Can I give you another true story? True story. Last year. A dear friend of mine who's a Christian apologist and a philosopher. I'm not going to mention his name, but I'm going to mention the school. Trinity Divinity Evangelical Seminary. It's Trinity Evangelical Divinity Seminary. Ted's. Trinity Evangelical Divinity Seminary. One of the top conservative evangelical seminaries in the world, and it's in Deerfield, Illinois. Google it. Google it. I was invited by this brother to his postgraduate class. Postgraduate, meaning people are now going on to, let's say, doctoral or PhD dissertations. Okay. I went in. He told me, pretend you're a Muslim. I went in there. They thought I was a Muslim. I asked basic questions about the Trinity, the canonization. And there was about, I believe, nine students, and they got rocked, and I decimated them, and not one of them could answer the objections. Not one of them. And these people had gone to four years of seminary. Honest to God, true story. I don't want to mention my brother's name because he hasn't given me permission, but it happened last year. I decimated, I think there were nine students, maybe six. Obliterated them, pretending to be a Muslim, asking basic Muslim questions. The Trinity, the deity of Christ, the canonization. They were humiliated. Then after the break, I came in. And I said, by the way, I'm a Christian. And you could see they looked horrified. When, but when I said I was a Christian, like, oh, thank the Lord. And then I started responding to the objections. And these are people who are in seminary and now in postgraduate studies. Okay. Are you with me there? But brother, it's not I'm just blessed. Mickey, you're blessed. You know why? When you seek God for wisdom, he will bring you the teachers after his heart to teach you. So why do you think the Lord gave me this wisdom? For me or to use it 
to bless you and build you guys up for the glory of Jesus. Okay? So, trust me when I say, I'm telling you. Now, unfortunately, Chaldean, Assyrian, the only way he can be a priest is if he goes to seminary. Unfortunate for you, buddy. If there was a way you could be a priest without going to seminary, more power to you. Because I promise you, Chaldean, Assyrian, you're going to remember my words. You're going to say, man, this Sam Shamoon was right. Boy, he told me. They're going to be teaching me theories of the Bible. No wonder Muslims and atheists have a field, field day attacking the Bible because they're quoting our professors. Let me give you this guy's name. I want you to check him out, Chaldean Assyrian. One of the greatest New Testament scholars of the 20th century. His name was Father Raymond E. Brown. Wrote one of the best commentaries on the Gospel of John. Do you know that Ra Ra uh, Raymond Brown is one of Shabir Ali's favorite scholars? Because Raymond Brown edited and or wrote commentaries on the Bible attacking the inerrancy of the Bible, admitting the Bible has mistakes, admitting we don't know who wrote Matthew or Mark or Luke, admitting that the Gospel of John has gone through three, three stages of editing, and he is, was, he passed away, a Catholic priest, and in some of his books, it even got the imprimatur, the imprimatur of Rome and the Nihil Obstat. And Shabir Ali loves him because he quotes his books to show the Gospels are full of errors. We don't know who wrote them. And not everything in the Gospels can be trusted. This is what they're going to be teaching you in your seminary. Okay? Get ready for it. So now with that said, let that said, as the Holy Spirit guides the conversation, controls the conversation for his glory. Yep, Chaldean Assyrian, I'm not lying. Again, Chaldean Assyrian, do Raymond Brown, Shabir Ali. Raymond Brown, Islam. Google it. It's right there. Do you know he's so bad, Chaldean Assyrian, that Robert Sengenis, Catholic apologist who is traditional, pre-Vatican II, right? Catholic apologist, did an entire seminary destroying Raymond Brown's liberal views. Okay, so tread lightly, my brother. You're going to go into that cemetery and come out more dead than alive. More dead than alive. Yep. Now, with that said, by the grace of the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit, in Jesus' name, do you understand what omnipresence doesn't mean and what omnipresence means? Omnipresence means and what omnipresence doesn't mean. We got that now? And you saw that according to Mark, Jesus is omniscient, omnipresent. You saw that example, right? See, thank you. Rude boy Q. In Speaker's Corner, you heard a Muslim quote Brown. Claimed that the story of Christ's birth was a made-up story. Yes, that's what Brown taught. He taught these things. Matthew and Luke are full of contradictions when it comes to the birth narratives. So we can't really trust their historicity. Right? Okay, so now focusing on this. Did you see evidence from Mark that Jesus is omniscient and omnipresent? That without having to be physically in the home of that demon-possessed girl, he commanded the demon, cast out the demon, and healed the girl without being there physically. Mark 7, 29 to 30. Let's look at it one more time. Yep, he passed away. He was a 20th century New Testament scholar. Mark 7, 29 to 30. And he said unto her, for this saying, go thy way. The devil has gone out of thy daughter. How would you know that, Jesus? You don't even know where the house was. Well, yes, he did. As God, he did. What I'm just saying, if I were to see it from a human perspective, she didn't even tell you where she lives. And she lives a great distance away. Not only did she not tell you where she lives, you already know the demon is calm. You cast out the demon from here. Yeah, that's what I did. And when she was gone, come to her house, she found the devil gone out and her daughter laid upon the bed. How did you do this, Jesus? Well, haven't you been reading Mark carefully from Mark 1? Mark 1 has already told you I am. I am Jehovah God. I am Jehovah, Israel's God of Isaiah chapter 40. I am the Lord, Ha'adan of Malachi 3.1 coming to my temple in Jerusalem. Don't you know I am? I am God in the flesh, the God man. Oh, wow. 
So you see the case I'm making from Matthew and Mark? Jesus is God Almighty in the flesh. Not the Father. He's the Father, Son. Not the Spirit, because he's working in union with the Spirit. Because the three persons are the one Godhead, the one Trinity. That's why the church was forced to formulate the doctrine of the Trinity. Now let's look at one more episode from Mark. This comes from my article here. I gave you the links, but I'm going to post it again. One more episode from Mark. Okay. Mark 6, 45 to 52. This is from that article. Everything I'm telling you is in the articles. Mark 6, 45 to 52. All right. See, I knew it. I got a, I got a mistake in that one. All right. Let's read. Mark 6, 45, 52. I forgot to put the chapter there. See, I got to go edit the paper. It's okay. Read with me because then we're going to explain Mark 13, 32. Mark 6, 45 to 52. And straightway he constrained his disciples to get into the ship, right? He forced his disciples to get into the ship. Pay attention. And go to the other side before unto Bethsaida, while he sent away the people. And when he had sent them away, departed into he departed into a mountain and prayed. So Jesus, the God-man, is an intimate communion prayer with the Father. He's not the Father. He's distinct from the Father in person, but he's in constant love, fellowship, communion with the Father. Depart into the mountain to pray. And when even was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he alone on the land. And when he saw them tolling in rowing, having our time, for the wind was contrary unto them. The wind was against them. Pay attention. These are experienced fishermen, experienced in the sea, and they're having a hard time. Okay. And about the fourth watch of the night, he cometh unto them, walking upon the sea, and would have passed by them. Pay attention to that phrase in 48. We're going to look at it again. He would have passed by them. But when they saw him walking upon the sea, they supposed it had been a spirit and cried out, a ghost and cried out. Now notice 50. You're not going to see it in the English. But I'm going to give you the Greek in a minute. For they all saw him and were troubled. And immediately he, he talked with them and saith unto them, Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. It is I, be not afraid. And when he went up unto them into the ship, the wind stopped, it ceased. And they were sore amazed, greatly amazed and astonished in themselves beyond measure and wondered, for they considered not the miracle of the lows, for their heart was hardened. Now, number one, number one, Mark 6.50. It's in that paper. You know where it says, be of good courage, it is I? Guess what the Greek is? Ego, I me. Literally, you know what he says in Greek? Literally, he says in Greek, take courage, I am. Take courage, I am. Ego, I me. Sound familiar? Take courage, I am. Did you catch it? The Greek is, I am. Ego, I me. It's I. I am. What I am? The I am of the Old Testament. The I am who is Jehovah. Now, let me get you the Greek link. Hold on. The link to the Greek. Greek link. Shit. Okay. Hold on. Let me get you the link to the Greek so you can see. He gave you the Greek, but if you can't read Greek, I'm going to give you BibleHub.com interlinear where they spell out the Greek in English letters called transliteration. Here you go. So you can verify it for yourself. Here you go. Click on it. When you click on it, tell me what the word is when it says, be, be of good courage, do not be afraid. Do you see? Take courage. Ego, I me. Right there, I am. Ego, I me. I am. Do you guys see it? So notice what Jesus did. He walked on the water. He trampled on the water. He controlled the wind, and he told them, don't be afraid of the wind and the wave. I am is here. But now let's look at Mark 6, 48. Mark 6, 48, one more time, because I'm going to show you the connection with Jesus. I mean, the connection with Job, I'm sorry. Okay. 
And he saw them toiling and rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he cometh unto them, walking upon the sea, and would have passed by them. Pass by them. See, if you don't know the Old Testament, you don't know this is the language of a theophany. What is a theophany? An appearance of God. Pass by them. Now, let's look at these two aspects of the story. Jesus passed by them, and he said, Take courage. I am. Do not be afraid. Exodus 33, 21 to 23. Exodus 33, 21 to 23. Let's see if you catch it. Let's see who's going to catch it. Jesus passed by them. And Jehovah said, Behold, there's a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock, and it shall come to pass, while my glory passeth by. My glory will pass you by. Jesus passed by them. That I will put thee in a cliff of the rock and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. My glory passes by. I pass by. Jesus passed them by. And it shall come to pass while my glory passeth by that I will put thee in a cliff of the rock and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. Now he's doing a Protestant on me. I said Exodus 33, 21 to 23. He posted 22 twice. You and Protestant are getting uh, uh, Alzheimer's, huh? And I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. So did you see what Jehovah said? I will let my glory pass by you, Moses, so you can see me visibly. I will pass by you. Jesus passed them by, and in passing them by, he revealed to, to them his glory as the I am who controls the winds and the waves. Exodus 34, verses 5 to 7. This is all my paper, folks. Exodus 34, verses 5 to 7. It's all my paper. Okay? And Jehovah descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of Jehovah, the Lord. And Jehovah passed by before him. <whistles> Jehovah passed by before him. And proclaim Jehovah, Jehovah, Yehovah, Yehovah, the Lord, Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. I don't know why I surprise you. So Jehovah passed by him. Now this one's a little long. 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 9 to 13. 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 9 to 13. 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 9 to 13. Now read with me. And he came thither unto a cave, this is Elijah, and lodged there, and behold, the word of Jehovah came to him, and he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? Why, why are you here? What are you doing here? And he said, I've been very jealous for Jehovah, God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left. And they seek my life to take it away. Right? And he said, go forth and stand upon the mount before Jehovah. And behold, Jehovah passed by. Jehovah passed by, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind, strong wind, rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before Jehovah the Lord. But Jehovah was not in the wind. And after the wind, <clears throat> an earthquake. But Jehovah was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But Jehovah was not in the fire. And after a fire, a still small voice. And it was so when Elijah heard it, they wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering in the cave of the cave, and behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Je Elijah? Jehovah passed by Elijah. Jehovah passed by Moses. The glory of Jehovah passed by Moses. Let's look at Mark 6.48 one more time. Mark 6.48 one more time. And he saw them tolling and rowing, Toiling and rowing, sorry, for the wind was contrary unto them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he cometh unto them, 
walking upon the sea and would have passed by them. Hmm. Jesus passed by them, trampling the sea, walking on the sea, having mastery over the sea. Job 9, verse 8. Job 9, verse 8. Yes, Guy Wilkerson, that would be similar to Job 9, verse 8. Okay. Which alone spreadeth out the heavens and treadeth upon the ways of the sea. Jehovah alone treads upon the ways of the sea, controls the ways of the sea. But that's what Jesus just did. He was treading upon the water, upon the sea, showing his mastery over the waves and the wind. Are you seeing it? Who's not getting it? Who's not getting it? Okay, one more time. Mark 6, verse 50. Mark 6, verse 50. One more time. Remember what he says here. For they all saw him and were troubled. Immediately he talked with them and saith unto them, Be of good cheer, it is I. I am. Be of good cheer, I am. Be not afraid. I am. Be not afraid. Isaiah 43, verses 1 to 2 and 5. Isaiah 43, verses 1 to 2 and 5. Chapter 43 of Isaiah, verses 1 to 2 and 5. Let's see if you make the connection. But now thus saith Jehovah that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not. Sound familiar? What did Jesus say in Mark 6.50? Do not be afraid. Fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. So the disciples were passing through the water. He was with them. And he said, fear not. Do not be afraid. What are you doing, Jesus? And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shall not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. Fear not, for I am with thee. I will bring thy seed from the east and gather thee from the west. Now Isaiah 43, 10 to 13. Isaiah 43, verses 10 to 13. Okay. Ye are my witnesses, say Jehovah. And my servant, whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Guess how the Greek renders that? Ego, me. Ego, me. I am. Right? Before me there was no God form, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am Jehovah the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. I have declared and have saved and have showed when there was no strange God among you. Therefore, ye are my witnesses, say Jehovah the Lord, that I am God. Yea, before the day was, I am he. I am. And there is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work, and who shall let it? Is it clear that Mark 6, 45 to 52 has now depicted Jesus as Jehovah God of the Old Testament? Jesus, like Jehovah, says, I am. Jesus, like Jehovah, passed by the disciples. Jesus, like Jehovah, tramples the waves and the winds and the sea. Jesus, like Jehovah, was with them as they went through the waters. And Jesus, like Jehovah, said, fear not. Do not be afraid. I am. And you're telling me that Mark has no intention of presenting Jesus as Jehovah God in the flesh. Is that what you want me to believe? Right? Is that what you want me to believe? So here's the link to this article again. It's all in the articles. Now, I want it to sink in. I want to give it a minute to sink in because we're now going to finish off the discussion on Mark 13, 32. Let it sink in, but here's what I want to ask. Is it clear that Mark and Matthew, both of which mention that the day or hour is only known to the Father, Mark and Matthew depict Jesus as Jehovah God Almighty in the flesh? And this story, by the way, is in Matthew. The story of Jesus walking on the waters, he gives us additional details. Matthew 14, write down Matthew 14, verses 22 to 33. Matthew 14, verses 22 to 33. What makes the Matthean version, the version of Matthew, even more amazing? In Matthew 14, 22 to 33, Jesus actually gives Peter power to walk. So not only does Jesus have power over the winds and the waves and the sea, he can then authorize you and give you power to walk 
on the winds and the waves and the sea as well. Right? Yep. So many people hate this true Jesus, Mickey, but aren't you thankful by the Holy Spirit? You love the true Jesus and are in love with the true Jesus and he's in love with you? Okay, so now, is it clear Mark and Matthew have gone out of their way to depict Jesus as Jehovah God in the flesh, right? Not just Matthew, but Mark, right? Was that clear? So I'll make sure it's clear. Amen, first and last. So here's my question. If it's clear they've portrayed Jesus as Jehovah, if he's Jehovah, doesn't Jehovah know all things? Doesn't Jehovah know all things? So if Jesus is Jehovah, he has to know everything. He has to know everything. So why doesn't he know the dare hour? Here's where you're going to have to learn your faith. Why doesn't he know the dare hour? Because the whole story of the New Testament, the story of the Gospels is Jehovah became man. Jehovah became flesh. Jehovah became a human being and humbled himself to take on human limitations, to experience human limitations in order to experience what it's like to be a true human being with limitations, with the exception of sin. So why would it shock you if Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are portraying Jesus as God Almighty who willfully condescended, humbly condescended, to become an actual human being, to take on an actual human nature, to experience actual human limitations, why then would it shock you that there's a sense in which, because he's man, he has to grow. Because he's man, he has to learn. Because he's man, he has to sleep. Because he's man, he gets tired, fatigued. Because he's man, he has to eat. Because he's man, he has to bathe. And if he truly became a human baby, a true human baby, not a phantom baby, that he would cry because he would have stomach pains, tooth aches, ear aches. He would lose his baby teeth because he chose to become truly human to experience the human condition in all its fullness with the exception of sin. Right? So, and I'm going to give you an article I did on the incarnation. I wrote an article on the incarnation to explain this. Would Jesus be truly human if... He didn't hunger. Would Jesus be truly human if he didn't hunger? Would he be truly human if he didn't thirst? Would he be truly human if he didn't grow? Go from a babe to a toddler to a child to an adolescent to an adult. Okay. Would he be truly human if his physical body didn't change as he grew older? That he had the shape of a baby, then the shape of a toddler, then... No. Would he be truly human if he didn't experience ear aches, tooth aches, right? Ear infections, got the common cold. And would he truly be human with a true human mind if in his human mind he was omniscient? Which human being is omniscient? No human being. No human being is omniscient. No human being can be omniscient. So if Jesus is truly human with a true human mind, if it's truly a human mind, then in his human mind, he can't know everything. Otherwise, he doesn't really truly have a human mind. You get my point? I just want this to sink in, and I'll give you my article on the incarnation because I want to still explain it. I'm not done. I'm walking you through the steps. In other words, send Isaac on his way. He's, he's, Isaac, you need to go, bro. This is too much for you. It's above your pay grade. Start in kindergarten. When you get to college, come here. Okay. In other words, Jesus can't be truly human, possessing a human mind. If his human mind is omniscient, then he's not truly human. And then we end up becoming like the Gnostics, who denied that the divine Christ became truly human. But no, he is truly human. Okay? You understand now? Is it sinking in? I'm going real slow. 
because I want this to sink in to understand what is incomprehensible. You're going to get an idea. Oh, okay. But you won't fully comprehend because God is an infinite mind beyond human comprehension. That doesn't mean you won't see it. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know how it works. But yeah, I can see. Yeah, okay. As man with a human mind, his human mind can't know everything, but he's also God. And as God, he possesses omniscience. But somehow the two natures remain distinct and fuse into each other. So one person had two natures that he didn't fuse into each other. They remain dist distinct. And he fully possessed all the attributes of deity and humanity, but they didn't get mixed up or garbled in. I don't know how that works, but I can see that's what the Bible says. Right? Is that clear? Just before I move on, because we're going to go back to Mark 13, 32. So should it shock you that Jesus, who is truly human, could say of the dear hour, no man knows, neither the angels of heaven nor the sun. Should it shock you that if Jesus is truly human, Luke 2.40 and 2.52 could say, the boy grew in stature and wisdom and favor between God and men. Should it shock you that the Jesus of history, who is the Jesus of the Gospels, who is a true human being, got tired? And had to rest and got hungry and had to eat and needed to sleep. If he didn't do any of that, he's not truly human, folks. The problem with Christians, and I'll tell you what the problem is. We overemphasize the deity of Christ at the expense of his humanity. Whereas the cults were anti-Trinitarians, overemphasize his humanity at the expense of his deity or even ignore his deity altogether. See the problem? You see the problem? Nope, 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 no, Irene. Wrong. Irene, you're not listening to me, sister. If he relinquished his deity, you just contradicted everything I showed you from the Bible. If he relinquished his deity, how is it that on earth he's still doing things that only God can do? How did he relinquish his deity, Irene? If he relinquished his deity, how is he still speaking as if he's God? doing things that only God can do, and possessing characteristics that only God possesses. And how does God stop being God? No, Irene, I don't know if you're following me then. Are you actually following me? I want to make sure, because that troubled me, that statement. To say he relinquishes his deity means you're saying he's not God on earth. No, he is God on earth. And he possesses the fullness of deity, right? That doesn't mean he always exercises his attributes in all their fullness. Just like God is almighty and he's almighty to destroy, but he doesn't exercise his power to destroy. He constrains himself from destroying people by the power that enables him to destroy people. So not exercising those attributes, right? or not making full use of an attribute, is something true of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Right? God, his anger burns every day righteously against sin, but he constrains himself from acting upon that anger and unleashing fury and destroying us by his power. So notice, he's not exercising his anger and power to destroy, he's constraining himself. The Father does that, the Son does that, the Holy Spirit does that. You want me there? Exactly. I love St. Nicholas for slapping the taste out of Arius' mouth. I would have said, give me five, brother. Pew. Right on, St. Nick. You've been very naughty, but it was nice. All right. Okay. All right. Is that clear? Did everyone get it now? Guys, thank you for the super chat. God bless every one of you. You know who you are. Lord bless you. Okay. I just want to make sure it's sinking in. Okay. Did that part sink in? Jesus was still, still God. Why do you think I gave you all these verses? To show you he wasn't God. He relinquished his deity. Never ever say Jesus relinquished his deity. He cannot stop being God. God can't stop being God. God can't stop being who he is. But, but it doesn't mean he has to make full use of all his attributes, right? Even now, 
God is not unleashing all his anger and the power that enables him to unleash all his anger and all its fullness. He's constraining himself. Right? So, but that's true of the father. The father constrains himself and doesn't make full use of all his attributes. So, so the son and so the spirit, three persons who possess the same essence fully, completely. So if that made sense, let's go back to Mark 13, 32. Because so I got a couple of things to say. And if I have enough time for other questions, I'll take it. But don't forget, God willing, Lord willing, this entire week, live Q&A, so now that I'm going to finish this question, provided a thorough exposition of this question by the grace of the Triune God, I will then take questions on other topics in the upcoming days, if the Lord wills, if he gives me the health and the holiness to do this for his glory. Okay? Mark 13, 32. But of that day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. I already explained yesterday in somewhat depth Okay. that this passage actually is a proof that Jesus is God Almighty. Go back and listen to the first two parts of this answer to this question. Yesterday was part two. The day before was part one. This is now the third part of my exposition. I demonstrated that as far as the Bible is concerned, when you talk about humans and angels, that's all of creation. Angels and humans mean all creatures. I gave you the proof yesterday. I can't repeat it because I don't want to elaborate on something I already discussed because our time is fleeting. So follow with me, right? Okay. When you say humans and angels, biblically, that's all creatures. So if I were to divide creator, creation, I had I wrote on a board, I put a line, creator, creation. On creation, you have angels and humans. We're not going to talk about animals or marine life or birds or fowls. Irrelevant. We're talking about sentient beings that the Bible talks about having communion with God. Yes, even animals have communion with God and God communicates to them. Don't believe me? God opened the mouth of an ass to speak with a human voice to silence a human ass, Balaam. God commanded that sea animal to swallow Jonah and it obeyed him perfectly and swallowed Jonah and then commanded that sea animal to vomit Jonah, and it understood this was the voice of my creator, and it obeyed instantly. Okay. So on the creation, creator divide. Creator, creation divide. On creation, angels and humans. Okay? So Jesus said, no human knows. All right. Well, that's to be expected, because unless God appears visibly and wants his voice to be heard audibly to the people on heaven, God remains invisible and secret to human beings. So, okay, that makes sense. Humans won't know the hour because God is hidden to them unless he wants to appear. And he does, but that's rare and that's not often. Neither the angels in heaven, and as I showed yesterday, the Bible says angels, these spirit creatures, are in heaven beholding God visibly and hearing God's voice audibly. Even though they're that close and they see God's visible glory and hear his voice audibly, they don't know. Well, according to the Bible, that's all creation. So here's the line. Imagine a line. Creator, creation. Angels, humans, that's it. What's left is now the creator. But now notice where Jesus placed himself. Notice where Jesus placed himself in that list. Mark 13, 32. Notice where Jesus placed himself. Though he became human, he's not merely human. Notice it's in ascending order. No humans. Neither angels, that's creation, nor the Son, but the Father alone. So wait, Jesus. You just differentiated yourself from all angels and humans. That means all creation. And you place yourself above all creation and even claim to be the true Son of the Father. Notice in that list, he alone is the Son to the Father. Everything else is a creation. So even in this passage... If you properly understand it and you have eyes to see and ears to hear, Jesus just showed, I am the true son of the father. I'm on the same side that the father is, separated from creation. Angels and humans, creation, creatures, I'm not among them, though I became human. I'm part of this side of the divide. I'm on the same side that my father is because I'm his son and belong to him. So even the passage... 
that they use to try to disprove Christ's deity shows he is the eternal son, greater than all creation, who belongs to the Father. Right? Do you see that? Even the passage that they're misusing backfires against them. You want me there? Backfires against them. So if a Muslim brings it up, this is what you tell the Muslim. Muslim, thank you for again proving to me Muhammad is a son of Satan and Antichrist and your Quran is a book of the devil. Why? This passage just proves I could never be a Muslim and Muhammad is a fraud. What do you mean? Do you believe Jesus is the son to the father? No. But you just quoted a verse where Jesus says he is the son, the true son of the father. That's number one. Number two, do you believe that Jesus is greater than all humans? That means he's greater than your Muhammad and your Muhammad is beneath his feet? No. Do you believe Jesus is greater than all angels and humans combined? No. So why are you quoting this? Why are you quoting the verse that proves your Muhammad is beneath the feet of Jesus? Jesus is the true son who's greater than all creation, none of which you can accept. So why are you quoting this? Why are you quoting this? I can see why Joe Witness would want to quote it, because he believed Jesus is a son, though a creature, and this passage contradicts him. You don't. And a Joe Witness does believe that Jesus, though a creature, is greater than all the other creatures. You don't. So why are you quoting this? You just buried your religion. Thank you. Don't ever mention Muhammad again to me. It's not an option according to Mark 13, 32. So we got that, right? We got that, right? Duana, in this particular context, it's not simply translating it as messengers because the messengers here are distinct from humans. Even humans can be messengers. So the point of Jesus is those messengers that dwell in heaven, those spirit creatures. Because typically, the word messenger is used for spirit creatures. So when you say to someone in Hebrew, malachim, they're going to assume unless you specify the spirit creatures who are God's messengers. And here, the malachim in Hebrew, the Greek would be angeloi, angelois, the Greek. Because they're differentiated from men, means he's not referring to human messengers, but spirit messengers, spirit creatures that dwell in heaven. You get what I'm saying, Dwana? Good question, by the way. Do you want to make sure you got it? Okay. So Mark 13, 32. Why doesn't Jesus the Son know the dare hour? In one sense, he does know it in respect to his spirit, divine nature. But in another sense, as a man, in his human mind, in his waking consciousness, he doesn't know all things, he only knows what the Father wants him to know and to relay in his waking consciousness, in his human mind, in respect to his human nature. Let me repeat the answer, and I'm going to unpack this. Here's the answer. In respect to Jesus' divine nature, he knows everything, even the dear hour. But remember, Jesus has a true human nature. And part of that nature, he has a human mind. And as a human being with a human nature, he has layers of consciousness. So in respect to his human consciousness, in his, in his human mind, in his waking human consciousness, he doesn't know everything, cannot know everything. So he only knows what the Father wants him to know and to relay in his human consciousness in respect to his human nature. All right. Thank you, brother from India. God bless you and watch over you. Okay, you with me there so far? Because I want to unpack it further. Remember, Matthew and Mark have both portrayed Jesus as God Almighty, who's a human being. Two natures, one person. As a true human being, he has a human body, human emotions, human will, human mind. And if being truly human means he has to have a human soul, human spirit, he has that. In respect to his human nature, in his waking human consciousness. What do I mean? Waking human consciousness. See, I'm awake right now. This is my waking consciousness. I'm not asleep. In his waking consciousness, he cannot know everything. 
He cannot have access to the full omniscience that he has as God because then he wouldn't be truly human and wouldn't be a truly human mind. He only knows and retains and recalls what the Father wants him to know and retain and recall in respect to his human waking consciousness, in respect to his human nature. Yes, in one sense, truth will set you free. I don't know how it works. He chose not to know. He only chose what the Father wanted him to know. And that's one of those things we can't fully comprehend. If my explanation sinks in, if you're confused, let me know. Because now I want to go back and mention the video that I gave you the link to yesterday. Which I cannot play because then they're going to shut me down for copyright infringement. Exactly, Alex Gaskin. Without making him two persons, he's one person. One eternal person. But somehow, the relationship of the two natures in that one person, in his divine main, that full of omniscience, cannot be transferred over in its totality to his waking human consciousness. Otherwise, he wouldn't truly be human with a true human mind. Okay, so no one's confused so far with my explanation. No one's confused because we're almost done. Everyone getting it? Okay, if you're getting it, you remember the video I sent you yesterday? Jesse the Body Ventura called the Manchurian Candidate. Do you remember that video? I told you watch it in preparation for today. You guys got that video? If someone has the link, post it again. Okay. This is a fact of science. It's a medical fact. And Jesse the Body Ventura exposed what they're doing in the military. Okay. Let me explain what they're doing in the military. Believe it or not, hypnosis is a fact. It's not make-believe. It's not superstition. Okay. Hypnosis is a medical fact. What they're doing in the military is they're hypnotizing soldiers to tap into their subconscious mind and giving them a trigger word that when they wake up and they hear that trigger word, they become berserk, they become killing machines. So if you saw that video, if you saw that video, this is what you saw. Someone hypnotized. A word was given to him in his subconscious mind that would be a trigger. Then he woke up and that trigger word would make him drag his feet. One of his legs would go pretty much numb and drag it if you watch the video the guy's away the the trigger word was given and he's talking to jesse venture and it's being recorded all of a sudden he starts you know dragging his feet because it goes numb and he's not aware that his foot is numb and he's dragging it then he, they play back the tape he saw he was put under hypnosis he saw he was fed a word subconsciously he saw, he woke up when he heard the word, his leg went numb and he had no clue it was happening to him. Now, what's my point? What's my point? We are temporal, finite, imperfect human beings. And notice how complex our humanity is, how complex our physiology is, how complex our minds and brains are in that as a human being, I have layers of consciousness. I have the waking consciousness and I have a subconsciousness. That video proved, and this is a fact, that human beings are able to retain and keep tons of information on a subconscious level that they don't have access to when they're awake. Now explain how that works. How is it? When I'm awake, I do not recall, remember, all that information embedded in my subconscious mind, information I've been storing since the time I came out of my mother's womb, that's there, intact, but I can't recall it. I don't remember it. How's that possible? Can you explain it? No, you can't. Now, folks, if that's true of human beings who are finite, imperfect, Temporal fallen creature, creatures. If we can have layers of consciousness, so in one layer, we don't know everything that we know on a deeper level and a deeper layer, why would it then shock you 
that when it comes to Jesus, who has a human nature, and part of that human nature has all these layers of consciousness, and then you add a divine nature, and he becomes so mind-boggling that in one sense, he doesn't know that they are our, in another sense, he knows all things, and we can't figure out how that works. Why would that shock you when we have something similar going on with human beings, and we only have one nature that's limited and temporal, and we have layers of consciousness on so my waking conscious, I don't know everything that I know on a deeper subconscious level. How does that work? How does that work? Nobody knows. But do we deny that it works? No, it's a medical fact. It is a fact. You can tap into someone's subconscious mind, feed him information, and when he's awake, he has no idea what you did. Hey, what's up, buddy? What happened? Oh, nothing. And then when you give him the trigger word, because it's there in the subconscious mind, his subconscious mind hears that trigger and makes him do what you suggested he should do when he was hypnotized. How is that possible? But it's a medical fact. So, folks, why would it shock you then? Jesus has your human nature, yet without sin, a human nature that has layers and levels of consciousness. So even on that regard, Jesus' subconscious human mind would know a lot more than Jesus' waking consciousness. And then when you add a divine nature, imagine how much more complex and confusing it gets. Focus, guys. Focus. So what's my point? Medical science, medical science has confirmed humans have levels and layers of consciousness. Okay? One level, we don't recall everything. On a deeper level, on a subconscious level, we have all that information that we've gathered since we came out of our mother's womb to the present, stored, and it's there, but we don't have access to it. Now, how is that possible? I don't know, but it's a fact. It's true. I don't know, but it's true. It's a fact. Science has proven it. So then why would you be shocked that Jesus, the God-man, on one level, he doesn't know the dare hour. He only knows what the Father wants him to know in his waking consciousness and what his Father wants him to reveal. But there's a deeper level to Jesus, even on the human level. There's a deeper human consciousness to Jesus, and then there is a divine mind that Jesus possesses, in which he knows a lot more than he does in his waking consciousness. So why should you be shocked? Though we don't fully comprehend, though we don't fully understand, just because you understand doesn't mean it isn't true. There are things in science like hypnosis that we know are true facts, but we can't comprehend how much more the God-man, Jesus Christ. So if that was clear, let me sum up what I'm trying to say, right? Sum up what I'm trying to say. Jesus, in his waking human consciousness, as a man in his waking consciousness, cannot possibly know everything. Then he wouldn't be truly human. In his waking consciousness, he only knows and can recall and retain what the Father wants him to know, recall, and retain, and reveal. But because Jesus is God, as God, there's a sense in which he possesses full om omniscience. But that omniscience was there, stored in his deeper, deeper inner being, right? On a level that his waking consciousness did not have access to. So it's not either or, it's both and. It's not either or, it's both and. Making sense now? To give you further examples just from human minds, we're just one nature that's imperfect, temporal, finite. What do you do with multiple personality? Here you have a person, and this is a psychosis. This is an illness. A person who can manifest different personalities without the one personality being aware of the other. How is that possible? One person, multiple persons, personalities, that's a psychosis. That's an illness. It's a disease. But still, what's my point? 
even the human mind, even the brain, as limited as it is, is so complex that a person with an illness can have split personalities, right? Assuming different personalities, and in those different personalities, assuming different roles, assuming different experiences, without the other personality being aware of the other. So why are you shocked that Jesus is the God-man? And there's a sense in which Jesus as God knows everything, but as a man, it's not possible for him to know everything. And in his waking consciousness, he only knows what the Father wants him to know and reveal. If that made sense to everyone, I can now put the icing on the cake and we can finish it off. Right? Here we go. Hater Wood. If the hater, yeah, hey, bro, I, I enabled the super chats. I was playing around. Acts 17, I super chats, and I've been getting super chats left and right. God bless you all. You know who you are. Lord bless you for your generosity. Even though Hater Wood told me they take 30% off, leaving me penniless again. No, I'm just kidding. God bless you guys. Every penny counts, and I thank God for you. Now, Hater Wood's going to have to tell me how to collect. How am I going to get the money? That I don't know. That will be a mystery. And by the way, it also allowed me uh, that stick uh, sticker feature you're talking about, Aderwood. It gave me that feature. What is it called? Super sticky? Okay, now, with that said, anyone confused? Say, I'm confused. If it made sense, I want to go back to Genesis 18 as a precursor of foreshadowing of what to expect if God became human. I know, I know, Sophia. I've been dying to drink water, but I don't want to walk up because I'm almost done anyway. All right. No one confused? Everyone got it? Thank you, Haterwood. My number one fan. I've been carrying you so long that my back will never be the same. You've caused me irreparable back damage. My nerves are shot from carrying that dead weight all my life. Okay. Okay, so if no one's confused, let me show you the Old Testament has prepared you for these limitations that Jesus experienced. Are you ready? I'm going to now show you the Old Testament has prepared you for these limitations that Jesus experienced. It's in the story of Genesis 18. We can't read it all. Let me sum up Genesis 18. In Genesis 18, Jehovah appears visibly to Abraham. He appears as a man. It says, Abraham looked up and he saw three men. If you read Genesis 18, verses 1 to 14, just glance at it. Three men, one of whom is Jehovah. These three men appear in human form that's so real and tangible, this human form. You can actually touch the human form and it feels like an actual physical body. And they eat meat, food, food. And wash their feet with water. You with me so far? So notice the human appearance. The human form is so tangible. They didn't become human by nature. They didn't take on a second nature and be born of a woman. They simply assumed, manifested in a human body. But that manifestation of that body was so real. You touch it and it feels physical. Flesh and bone. They can eat and their feet is so tangible. You can apply water and wash their feet. Now, one of the three... If not all three, because I made a case that it could be the Trinity there. But let's put that aside. One of the three is Jehovah. I did a session where I showed all three possibly were Jehovah. Father, Son, and Spirit. Three persons appearing as three men. Notice again, three, not four. Not a coincidence. But anyway. So now Jehovah appears as a man, doesn't become a man, isn't born as a baby. So he doesn't take on an extra nature, right? But he simply assumes human form, speaks as if he's a man, to speak to Abraham face to face. Now that said, notice the language of Jehovah in Genesis 18, verses 20 to 21. Notice in Genesis 18, 20 to 21. I believe that too, Anna. I believe it was the Trinity, the three persons of God appearing in human form, because all three can appear in human form. But anyway, if someone wants to take the other view that one of them is Jehovah, still, Jehovah was there. You can't get around it. Jehovah was there. Genesis 18, 20 to 21. And Jehovah said, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, notice, I will go down now. So Jerusalem was up, Sodom was down. I'm going to go down to Sodom. 
and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which is coming to me. And if not, I will know. Wow. Wait, Jehovah, you're omnipresent. The entire creation is present before you. You know everything that takes place. Why do you speak as if you're an actual human being that can only be at one place at one time and needs to investigate something in order to verify what you heard about someone is true? Why are you speaking this way? You need to go down. So you got to travel from point A to point B. And you need to then go and verify what you heard is true. So you need to go investigate and see the city for yourself in order to confirm the reports about how evil they are. It's true. Why do you speak as if you're a man who's limited to time and space, limited in knowledge, and don't simply take someone's opinion for it, but will go and carefully investigate a matter to confirm whether it's true or not? Now, if Jehovah can speak this way simply by assuming human form, what do you think will happen to Jehovah if and when he becomes truly human? If he's speaking like this without truly being human, but simply assuming human form, assuming human limitations, speaking as if he's a man with human limitations, then why would it surprise you that when Jehovah does become man, then he will personally experience genuine human limitations. So you see how this story is preparing you. What to expect if Jehovah were to become truly human? He wouldn't be a superhuman where he wouldn't be limited to time, space, and location. He wouldn't be a superhuman where he would be omniscient in respect to his human mind because then he's not truly human. He would be human like any other human Limited time, space, location, having to grow, having to search things out. With one exception, he'd be sinless. Making sense? Making sense? So you see how Jehovah in the Old Testament is preparing you for Jehovah of the New Testament becoming flesh if jehovah the old testament assuming a human form without actually becoming man can speak as a genuine human being with genuine limitations in order to speak on abraham's level then why would it shock you that when jehovah does become man he does so to experience genuine human limitations and not make it easy for himself But Walter, Jesus, turn it against them. Say, if Jesus can't be God because he doesn't know the dare hour, then Jehovah can't be God because he doesn't know everything that takes place and has to investigate things for himself. So if Jesus not knowing the dare hour disqualifies him from deity, then Jehovah in Genesis 18 disqualified himself from deity because he doesn't know what takes place on earth and has to investigate it. You see the point? It proves too much. But now, can I explain to you why Jehovah speaks this way to Abraham? Because if you read from Genesis 18, 20 to 33, which we won't. But if we read from Genesis 18, 20 to 33, which we, don't, we won't, we won't have time. Then Abraham tells Jehovah, what if you find 50 righteous? He goes, for the sake of 50, I won't destroy it. In fact, let's look at it. Yeah, let's look at it. Let's read Genesis 18, 23 to 26. Because this is now going to... Show you something. Okay. Genesis 18, 23 to 26. And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Right? Peradventure, perhaps there may be 50 righteous within the city. Wilt thou also destroy and not spare the place for the 50 righteous that are therein? That be far from thee, far be it from you to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked. That be, that be far from thee, far be it from you to do that. Treat the righteous like the wicked. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Now watch this. And Jehovah said, if I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. Wait, 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 Jehovah. I thought you're all-knowing. And omnipresent. Don't you know whether there's 50 in the city or not? 
Why do you have to find out if there's 50? Why do you have to find out if there's actually 50 righteous? So you got to go down there to see if there's righteous people there. And then you're going to know whether they're righteous or not. But you're Jehovah God. You're present everywhere. You know everything that takes place the moment it takes place. So you don't know right now that there are 50. You got to go down and find out. You got it? So if Jehovah appearing as a man in human form without actually becoming human in nature can assume human limitations and speak as if he's truly a human being who's limited to time, space, and location, why would you be shocked that when Jehovah does actually become a man and does actually take on a human nature, that he would humble himself to then experience human limitations in a genuine and real way? You get my point? Is that clear, the point I'm making? God bless you, Shoaib Rasuli. God bless you and preserve you, Shoaib Rasuli. Hater Wood, did you read that? Sam, I'm an ex-Muslim, and I finally subscribed to your channel. I've been following you and Brother David Wood since ABN days. You've had a huge impact on my life to find Christ. Thank you. My pleasure to be your servant for the sake of Jesus. Okay, now, let me explain why God is saying this. The reason why God is saying this is to assure Abraham. Abraham, rest assured. Now, let me explain why God is speaking as if he's actually human with actual human limitations here in Genesis 18. Let me explain it for you because this is a lesson for all of us. Now, practical application. Let me end it with practical application, a lesson for all of us. God is saying to Abraham, Abraham, here's why I need you to listen, guys. Listen. Abraham, rest assured that when I destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, they deserved it. I didn't rush in judgment. I wasn't haste to destroy them. They deserved it, Abraham. So how does God assure Abraham? He's speaking as if he's a man who is going to personally verify how wicked they are because he's telling Abraham, I don't simply take another person's word for it. I don't simply go off of what someone tells me. When I do something, rest assured that I have carefully investigated the matter and I've come to a conclusion regarding the fate of a group of people or an individual, I don't simply take another person's word for it and run to judgment. In other words, what God is saying to us, don't ever rush to judgment. Don't ever formulate an opinion. Don't ever come to a conclusion simply on hearsay, what someone has told you until you've carefully investigated the matter Hear all sides out, piece together all the facts, and then make an informed decision. In other words, what God is saying, if I myself don't simply go off of hearsay or what people tell me, how much more should you not base a judgment or decision on someone else's opinion on hearsay? If God Almighty doesn't simply do something on the whims of what he's received or heard from some second party or third party, then how much more should you, his followers, not make a decision, come to a conclusion, pass judgment on the basis of information you receive from a second party or third party? You see the point? That's what you're supposed to learn from this conversation between God and Abraham. Abraham. I am not human. I don't rush to judgment and haste, right? And I don't simply go off of second or third party testimony. Rest assured, if I destroy Sodom, and I will, they deserved it, and there weren't even 10 righteous in the city. So know and be at peace. They deserve the judgment I'm about to unleash on them. You got it? I hope you guys now learn how to answer Mark 13, 32. Saul, how much meat there is in Mark 13, 32. How, how much meat there is in Matthew and Mark. How much, how much meat there is in the Old Testament, New Testament. How much meat there is in proving the Trinity, Jesus is God and man, and the Bible is his word. Because truly the Bible is his word. The God of the Bible is real. And the God of the Bible is triune. 
And Jesus is God in the flesh. Amen. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Please do a miracle for me and my daughters. Save me from these shackles. Give me the financial freedom and free me from all attacks of a corrupt system, Father. Bless every one of us here. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Fill us with your presence, with your love. Fill us with holiness and purity and give us the grace, the power to obey you, to worship you, to fear you, to proclaim your glory, the glory of Jesus. Cover us by the blood of Jesus and may Jesus sit and throne upon our hearts and increase in us. May we decrease. Please, Father. Please, Lord Jesus. Please, Holy Spirit. And do a miracle for me and my daughters. Let me hear from them and embrace them and hug them and love them, Lord. And until I do, preserve them, please. And preserve me for them. And please provide for the ministry, Father, for your glory. Please, please provide for the ministry, Lord Jesus. Please provide for the ministry, Holy Spirit. You don't need me. I need you. Bless them who are listening. Fill them, Holy Spirit. Sanctify them. Transform them. Transform all of us. Loosen our tongues to speak clearly and passionately, boldly, without compromise, but also to temper it with love, grace, mercy, and patience for the glory of Jesus. We thank you, Father, Son, and Spirit. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Lord Jesus, you are Jehovah, Yahovah, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that became flesh to the glory of God, your Father. Come sooner than later, Lord Jesus, and keep us in love with you. Wash us and our loved ones. Wash my daughters in your holy blood, O Lamb of God. And never let us go. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord willing, tomorrow, okay, more live q and I'm going to take other questions. So write out your questions and get them ready. Lord willing, tomorrow, again, somewhere between 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's New York time, Canadian time. Between 3 and 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, New York time, Canadian time. Now, in these three sessions, you have now been given a thorough exposition of what it means for Jesus not to know the dare hour. That means, don't ask me this question again. Study these sessions. Absorb the information. Save those links to the article. Study them. Pass them on to others. And proclaim Christ crucified and risen, risen indeed. The Lord Jesus be with you all. Be with my daughters and be with me. Amen.